Most of the contracts we have seen in this course are the product of verbal, either oral or written agreements between the parties. Today, we're going to consider contracts that might exist without an explicit agreement. The 1969 case of Bailey versus West is often one of the first cases taught in a contracts course because it touches on important principles of contract formation. We will use the case to introduce several important concepts, including implied in fact contracts and quasi contracts, or contracts implied in law. These terms might sound like fancy legalese for now, but they will make sense very soon. The defendant appellee in this case, Richard West, purchased a horse named Bascom's Folly from Dr. Strauss. The defendant's trainer subsequently discovered that the horse was lame. The trainer tried to send the horse back to Strauss, but Strauss refused to accept it. The horse uh, deliverer, who's referred to in the opinion as one Kelly, then under instruction from the defendant's trainer that he should do whatever he wanted to do with the horse, but that he wouldn't be on any farm at defendant's expense, delivered the horse to plaintiff appellant Bailey. Uh, plaintiff accepted the horse, understanding that its ownership was disputed and sent bills to both defendant and to Strauss before selling the horse after caring for it for four years. Defendant returned the bills unpaid with notations that he did not own the horse. There's something ironic in the plaintiff's name. In property law, a bailment is a legal relationship where a bailor entrusts physical possession of personal property uh, to another person who is called the bailee. So uh, in this case, Howard Bailey is a bailee who was entrusted with the horse. And in this case, the plaintiff sued to recover the reasonable value for services rendered uh, in caring for the horse. The trial court awarded, awarded plaintiff's costs for the first five months of care, as well as certain expenses for trimming the horse's hooves. Uh, the trial court uh, reasoned that because the Supreme Court in a separate dispute had found that West owned the horse and owed Dr. Strauss the purchase price, that there was a contractual impl a contract implied in fact to care for the horse until West notified Bailey otherwise. The instant court in this case, however, reversed the trial court's finding of liability and instead found for the defendant, West. Before we go on, take a look at this question. Uh, why does the opinion use the phrase clearly erroneous when discussing the quasi-contract claim? Well, this is a standard of review for factual issues, uh, the clearly erroneous standard of review, which is in contrast and distinct from the de novo standard for reviewing questions of law. An appellate court should only set aside a factual finding of a trial court if that finding is clearly erroneous. Well, so in this case, there are two major issues. First, was there an implied in fact contract between the plaintiff and the defendant? And second, was there a quasi contract or a contract implied in law between the plaintiff and defendant? Let's first take a look at whether an implied in fact contract exists. An implied in fact contract is a contract where the party's agreement is inferred from their conduct rather than by explicit words. If you go in a restaurant and the server asks you, what will you have? And you respond, give me a pastrami on rye, uh, please. Uh, do you have an explicit contract? Well, no. Nobody promised anybody anything. You never explicitly promised a waitress that you would pay. You said, give me something. But as you already know, the lack of an explicit agreement is not really relevant. You're going to be on the hook to pay for the food that you ordered and ate because of the conduct of the overall circumstances. By sitting down at a table in a restaurant and ordering food off the menu, that made you contractually liable for an implied in fact contract. 
It's implied by the facts of your conduct or the surrounding circumstances. An implied in fact contract has the same legal effect as an express contract. Express contracts are the contracts we've been studying in other cases. The main difference is that the people use words in an express contract, while an implied in fact contract, people manifest their mutual assent by their actions and their words. Uh, for an implied in fact contract to exist, two conditions must be satisfied. There must be one, mutual agreement, and two, there must be an intent to promise. In this case, the court found these elements to be lacking and held there was no implied in fact contract. The plaintiffs knew that the ownership of the horse was in dispute and sent multiple bills uh, to different people uh, not knowing who was going to be responsible. And therefore, the plaintiff should have known that neither West nor Strauss had agreed to the transaction. It's socially valuable to, prom to promote mutual assent. If we have mutual assent, we have a revealed preference uh, argument and inference that the contract is increasing the welfare of each of the parties. Without mutual assent, it's unclear whether value is created. People will be forced into contracts that they did not want to enter. The, the difference here is if we can, if we're confident that both sides had agreed to the transaction, we can infer by their conduct, by their revealed preference for assenting to the contract that they, that they're, each of them are better off by entering. But in a case like this where their conduct is not clear, we can't make this revealed preference inference that value has been created. Allowing for implied in fact contracts seems to make a lot of sense. Life would be a lot more inconvenient if, say, you had to sign a contract every time you went into a restaurant. However, you might wonder if the lack of explicit agreements presents other problems. For instance, does a party's subjective intent matter? Suppose you sit down at the restaurant but secretly harbor no intent to pay. Does that let you out of the contract? Well, the answer is no, of course. Generally, when uh, <clears throat> settling disputes about contract formation, rather than subjective intent, the law looks to the reasonableness of the other person's inferences. If it's reasonable for the waitress to infer that you implicitly promise to pay when you order the sandwich, the same applies to express contracts which refers to the verbal or written agreements that we've been studying in these other cases. Thus, if I say, I'll sell you my watch for $400, and you say I accept, your honest but uncommunicated belief that there's no contract until a writing is signed will be irrelevant. The fact that you manifested an intent to contract, it's reasonable for me to hear what you said as entering into a contract, that's going to be enough for courts. Here's a quiz for you. In Bailey v. West, if the court had used the reasonableness of the listener's expectation standard, should the plaintiff have prevailed? No. It wasn't reasonable for Bailey to think that he had an agreement to board the horse. Bailey didn't even know with whom he was contracting, and he again, he sent bills to both West and Strauss. There's nothing that Bailey heard that would have made it reasonable for him to think that he had entered into a contract. His assumption that he was to take care of this horse was unreasonable. The plaintiff had reason to know that there was no mutual assent. The defendant neither said nor did anything to create reasonable expectations or from which a promise to pay might be implied. So, even if the plaintiff cannot prevail on his first claim, that there was an implied in fact contract, he still has another argument, that there was a quasi-contract or a contract implied in law. Quasi-contracts are not true contracts. They are obligations imposed by the law in, in cases where a contract should have existed, where promises should have been made, but no actual or implied promises actually happened. Uh, the main goal of quasi-contract as a separate cause of action is to remedy the po possibility of unjust enrichment, namely one party getting a, a significant benefit without having to pay for it. 
which leads to an inequitable result. Quasi-contracts are also known as implied-in-law contracts, constructive contracts, sometimes referred to as unjust enrichment causes of actions. Uh, so don't be confused if you hear these different terms. They all mean something close to the same thing. They are all equitable causes of action, which like many things in equity, are less rule-like and have fuzzier elements and probabilistic legal outcomes. For a quasi-contract to exist, the court states that, uh, that there are three conditions which must be satisfied. First, there must be a benefit conferred upon the defendant. Second, the defendant must appreciate the benefit. In other words, the defendant must feel the benefit. Uh, and finally, it would be inequitable for the defendant to retain the benefit without making a payment to the, pla to the plaintiff. In this case, the court found that no quasi-contract existed. The defendant never accepted the benefit conferred by the plaintiff, mainly the, this raising or caring for the horse. The court especially emphasized the importance of respecting individual autonomy in contracts, saying, quote, a person is not required to deal with another unless he desires to, and ordinarily a person should not be required to become an obliger unless he so desires. Another way to think about the issue is that the plaintiff was acting as a volunteer. You are officiously conferring a benefit if you do it expecting payment without giving the payor the chance to decline. This affects the third factor, acceptance and retention of the benefit by the defendant. The court found that the plaintiff was a mere volunteer and hence unreasonable in conferring the benefit which the defendant clearly did not want, or at least did not clearly want. Al alternative conditions have also been proposed for thinking about what is a quasi-contract. For instance, I hereby propose the would've, couldn't've standard to explain quasi-contract liability. To my mind, quasi-contract liability is more likely to lie if the plaintiff can show that the defendant would have been willing to contract to pay for the benefit that the defendant uh, that was conferred on the defendant, but that the defendant couldn't enter into an express uh, or implied in fact contract. The classic example of quasi-contract liability concerns the pedestrian who is hit by a car and is lying unconscious in the street. A passerby provides medical assistance saves the pedestrian's life, and then sues for quasi-contractual damages. The would've, couldn't've elements are clearly present. The pedestrian would have been willing to contract to pay for his life being saved, but the passerby has a pretty good excuse for not securing an explicit agreement, since the pedestrian was passed out at the time uh, that this benefit was conferred. Bailey, in contrast, doesn't have any good excuse for not securing a more explicit agreement. Uh, we have just been exposed to a lot of new and important legal terms. Let's take some time to review them. Number one, an express contract is a contract that was created with the party's verbal agreement on the promises and performances. These are contracts where the agreement was explicitly stated on paper or orally. And then number two, an implied in fact contract is a contract in which the agreement is inferred by the party's conduct, ordering food at a restaurant or going for a doctor's appointment are often examples of implied in fact contracts. And then finally, a quasi contract or a contract implied in law is not a true contract. It's not one where people made explicit or implicit exchange of promises. Instead, it's an obligation imposed by the law to prevent unjust enrichment. It's also called this as an implied in law contract or a constructive contract. There doesn't have to be mutual agreement for a quasi contract. Now that we've reviewed these terms, you're ready for an important question. So what's the difference between an implied in fact contract and a quasi contract?
Well, implied in fact contracts like express contracts involve chosen obligations. They are obligations that the people opted into by their actions or words. In contrast, quasi-contracts involve obligations that are not mutually chosen. They're not mutually assented to. They are instead implied in law, chosen by the courts to emulate the deals that the parties would have agreed to if they had had the chance. Here are some interesting parting thoughts and questions. Number one, suppose West personally delivered Bascom's Folly to uh, Bailey's farm, but nothing was specifically said about Bailey caring for the horse or West's paying for that care. Would West be liable then? Well, the answer is that West would probably be liable on the finding that they had an implied, in fact, contract. As we discussed earlier, this pattern of conduct, this behavior, seems to suggest mutual assent and an intent from both parties to be contractually bound for the care of the horse. Number two, what if Bailey found Bascom's Folly collapsed alongside the highway, took the horse in, and cared for the horse, and thereafter sought out West for payment? Would West be responsible for Bailey for the care given to the horse? And if so, on what theory? Well, the answer there is West would probably be liable on a quasi-contractual claim, or at least it would be arguable. In that case, Bailey conferred a measurable, be a measurable benefit on West, who was the owner of the horse, and Bailey would have a good excuse for not obtaining explicit agreement in advance because the horse was in immediate need of care. And finally, if West gets to keep the horse afterwards, then there's a good argument that there's unjust enrichment. West essentially got free medical treatment for the horse without having to pay for it. And, and what should we think about what happened to the proceeds of the horse's sale? They seem to have been retained by the plaintiff. So even under the plaintiff's theory of the case, these sums should have offset the amount owed by uh, the defendant. This case might have turned out differently if Bailey had returned the horse to West after caring for it and West had sold the horse. Today, we have examined a case that introduced us to the difference between three major types of contracts. Explicit contracts, which were formed by express agreement. Implied in fact contracts, which were formed by inference of the party's conduct. And finally, quasi-contracts, where there is no mutual assent and uh, exchange of promises, but a benefit is conferred by one party on another party, and that receiving party is liable as a matter of law to pay the, uh, for that benefit. And we've also learned that implied in fact contracts require a mutual agreement and intent to promise. Quasi contracts do not require mutual agreement. Instead, there must be a benefit that is non-officiously conferred on another party, and that party must appreciate the benefit and retain it.